Welcome back to the SDG Action Zone. It is the final day of our super week for the SDGs, and I can tell how excited you are, which means it's been an awesome week at the UN. It's a Friday morning at 8 a.m., and you're looking better than ever. So, hello, live stream audience. We are so happy to see you. Let's give them a big cheer. <laughs> We want you all to keep posting. You've been doing an amazing job all week, um, and we've had hundreds of millions of engagements across all three uh, hashtags. But keep going. The hashtags are Act for SDGs, SDG for, how about I start again? The hashtags are Act for SDGs, hashtag for people for planet, and hashtag SDG Action Zone. It's been a long week, but we know you're going to keep the conversation going. And today we're going to focus on oceans and small island states. We're actually going to live stream the SID Summit, which is official name is the High Level Review of Progress on Samoa Pathway. But for ease of reference, we'll say the SID Summit, and of course that stands for Small Islands Developing States, and we're going to have a jam-packed program of amazing sessions, starting with the one coming up right now. So, I'm so excited to introduce Around the World in 60 Minutes, Snapshots of Ocean and Climate Change Action, hosted by the UN Division for Ocean Affairs and the Law of the Sea of Office of Legal Affairs. And I'll just read you a little bit. Understanding the links between climate change and oceans has never been more critical. This event brings together alumni of the prestigious UN Nippon Foundation Fellowships to discuss their national work tackling climate change and oceans, including in the context of the SDGs, which of course is what we're talking about all week. So they have their own special moderator, so I will introduce her and she'll bring up the entire panel. Please welcome the Director of the Division for Ocean Affairs and the Law of the Sea at the Office of Legal Affairs at the United Nations, Ms. Gabrielle Gutcha Wanley, and her panel. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you all for coming to this event, which is proving going to be a very exciting one. And as already mentioned, our title of this SDG Action Zone event is Around the World in 60 Minutes, Snapshots of Ocean and Climate Change Action. Ladies and gentlemen, in the context of climate change, our ocean plays a critical role in terms of mitigation, both as a carbon sink and as a source of emissions generated by ocean-related sectors. Our ocean regulates our climate and also our weather patterns. Thus, there's a close relationship between the ocean, climate, and human well-being. But as we learned from the special report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change on Oceans and the Cryosphere in a Changing Climate, which was released two days ago, our ocean has become warmer, more acidic, and less productive as a result of global warming. Ocean ecosystems are being adversely affected, as well as activities as the basis of sustainable ocean-based economies on which many coastal states depend. In addition, melting glaciers and ice sheets are accelerating sea level rise, and coastal extreme events are becoming more serious thus posing a threat to human life and loss, and also resulting in potential loss of territory. Of course, the adverse impacts of climate change on our ocean and coastal communities also have a crucial bearing on whether we can achieve the sustainable development goals of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And here I'm not only referring to SDG 13, which is the climate goal, and SDG 14, which is the ocean goal. With small island developing states and low-lying coastal developing states, women, youth, and other vulnerable people, all disproportionately affected by climate change, our ability to address the climate crisis has implications across the sustainable development agenda. Clearly, there's a need for urgent action, as also evidenced by the Secretary General convening the, global, uh, the Climate Action Summit this week and by the many statements that were made at that summit. It is not too late to turn the tide. Solutions exist. We can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We can 
make maximum use of nature-based solutions. We can develop more our offshore renewable energy. And yes, we can take more effective action to address other current pressures on the oceans, such as pollution and overfishing. And yes, we can help the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Today's event provides an opportunity to hear from a group of exceptional individuals who are working on the ground around the world on issues directly related to the ocean climate nexus. Our six speakers are alumni of the United Nations Nippon Foundation Fellowship Programs, which are capacity building programs funded by the Nippon Foundation and implemented by the Division for Ocean Affairs and the Law of the Sea. Our six speakers are divided into three snapshot panels on one, oceans, climate and SDGs, two, transport and three, education and capacity building. And I look very much uh, look forward to hearing from them and of course also to hear from you later on during the discussions. So now to start our first panel, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Maria Amalia Rodriguez Chavez from Costa Rica, please. Well, good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining today, uh, our activity. So, uh, I'm, as Gabi was saying, my name is Maria Malia Rodriguez. I'm from Costa Rica. Uh, I'm a lawyer, and I work on policy advocacy in a negotiation process for a new ocean treaty that is taking place here at the UN, and that I will explain a little bit more in, in some minutes. So, this morning, I wanted to focus in two uh, brief elements. The first one is the link between oceans and climate. And the second point that I want to address is how we keep ambition in implementing SDG 14, that is life below water. So think about the air that you breathe. Half of it comes from the ocean. Also think about the last thing that you bought in a store. It probably arrived to your country in a vessel that uh, navigated through thousands of kilometers in the ocean as 90% of the world's trade is carried by sea. Uh, also think, think about a, um, the millions of people that rely on fish as their own source of protein, and also the people that are living in areas that has been impacted by severe weather events. So the ocean is the single most important driver of our climate and earth system, while providing a livelihood, uh, yeah, sorry, livelihood uh, support uh, um, throughout the world. So the fate of our oceans and climate are uh, indivisibly linked together. As Gabby was saying, on Wednesday, there was a release of a report of the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. And there we can understand from science that uh, our oceans can't, uh, it, it's like the capacity for them to buffer climate change and also to absorb uh, greenhouse gas emissions is not limitless. And there's a high, pri uh, high price that has been paid by our oceans. Some of the effects that we have been reading from these uh, findings in the report is ocean acidification, uh, biodiversity loss, sea level rise, among many others. So these impacts are happening and will be occurring across all latitudes, making this a global um, concern. However, today we're not here writing an obituary for the oceans. We're just taking serious, uh, a serious message about how urgent actions are uh, to be taken. The second point that I want to address today was uh, it's keeping up on uh, high ambition to implement uh, SDG 14. So the 2030 agenda sets a 15 year roadmap for international action uh, on, critical pil on the critical pillars uh, to achieve sustainable development. Therefore, keeping high ambition and strong political support uh, on the implementation of SDG 14 will ensure healthy oceans and also the well-being of marine ecosystems, biodiversity, and human beings. Within the different targets of SDG 14, I do want to draw your attention on the negotiation process of a new ocean treaty for the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Those areas are the ones located after the 200 nautical miles of the country's exclusive economic zones, and they cover 46% of the first surface of our planet. 
in this specific process, it's where my work relates. Uh, I do policy advocacy with other non-governmental organization, organizations that they are members of the High Seas Alliance. Uh, we provide and facilitate technical information to member states that we coordinate with. So it goes from science, policy, and legal advice. We also facilitate uh, communications and we raise awareness about the importance on having a robust treaty uh, by 2020. The participation of so, uh, civil society and observers in these negotiation processes, they promote transparency, accountability, and inclusiveness. So this uh, negotiation process is one of uh, an example of how the countries can achieve is the, uh, the target 14C, which is how they are calling for countries to ratify ocean-related instruments for the conservation and sustainable use of marine uh, resources. So as the, as the Paris Agreement in 2015 sent a message to the world that uh, the world, sent a message, sorry, that the world was uh, ready to work together towards climate action, this new negotiation of an ocean treaty has the opportunity to demonstrate that the uh, world is again ready to act together and take ambitious and strong decisions that will benefit almost half of our planet. So in closing, momentum is growing and we need a tsunami of efforts and very concrete actions for the protection of our global ocean and our global climate. And we all agree that we cannot do one without the other and that we all depend on our survival uh, from them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, for that uh, very clear link between oceans and climate change, sustainable development, and of course also with a specific focus on the ongoing negotiations on a um, new legally binding instrument under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea on the Conservation and Sustainable Use of Marine Biological Diversity of Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction. Now I'm pleased to give the floor to our second speaker, Mr. Hendra Siri from Indonesia. Thank you, Madam Directors. Uh, my name is Hendra Siri. I'm um, from Indonesia. I'm currently working for the UN Secretariat for Coral Triangle Initiative for Coral Reef Fisheries and Food Security. This is an international organization for the six countries in Asia and Pacific. So um, you might know that, that we have a green carbon, black carbon, and also currently we have a blue carbon right now. So green carbon referred to the forest, black carbon referred to the coal, and one of, we can see this is currently discovered is, what not discovered, but this is like the inventing, what we call this a blue carbon. Blue carbon means like the carbon captures in the coastal ecosystem. It can be captured in mangrove, captured by um, seagrass, as well as from the salt marsh. So <clears throat> we are talking about for the blue carbon itself, it's not only for what we call this, especially for the mangrove, not only for the, uh, the canopy, but below the ground is really important. This is a carbon we capture for the long, long time, for more than 100 years, that storage many megaton or gigaton of the carbon. So the thing is um, how that is important because this is can be, uh, can be reduced the, uh, can, re can reduce the um, uh, disaster, but as well as can be part of the uh, um, uh, alternative income generations. So we need to conserve this uh, carbon ecosystem. Currently, uh, what the uh, good news is, and also uh, we have more than four, um, six million hectares of uh, mangrove in, uh, in, in the world and in Indonesia and also from the Malaysia is represent like 4.6 uh, mangrove ecosystem in the world. But the bad news is we lost is almost 2% each year for the mangrove ecosystem in the world. So this is, we need to conserve that because this is one of that the area that we need to uh, conserve it. And <coughs> the coral triangle that's uh, the, pres the region at the present, this is really uh, stretched from the Eastern Indonesia up to the Eastern Malaysia, down to the Philippines, up to Timor-Leste, Solomon Island, and Papua New Guinea, it represents almost uh, uh, half of the mangrove ecosystem in the world. So this is really important. And we have also plenty of the coral ecosystem there. And we have some um, good example, especially to maintain 
the blue carbon ecosystem, it not only benefit for the carbon capture itself, but it can be also to give the income generation for the uh, coastal communities. What examples like in Indonesia, when we maintain the mangrove ecosystem for the Papua itself, it can be also can produce the mud crab that uh, very uh, very good in good quality, and it's also is a premium for for the price. And the Malaysia, for example, it can be uh, convert into the what we call this ecotourism, especially when we apply the ecosystem approach for fisheries management. This is one of really important way to do it. But the mangrove itself, it can be, you know, reduce the a kind of disaster such as like part of the tsunami, also the sea level rise. So uh, this is one of the example how we can see this is as natural based solutions. We have a uh, plenty of uh, uh, actions that are done by our member countries that playing, uh, putting mangrove as a guardian of the nature, especially for the coastline. And also to reduce the impact of the uh, sea level rise by putting mangrove and then also reduce the, uh, the carbon uh, in the region. Um, I would like to conclude my remark by saying that so, uh, maintaining and conserve the blue carbon itself is not only part of the SDG 14, but it can be also part of the SDG 13 the climate actions, it also can be part of the SDG one for the uh, uh, no, no property, and then also life on land as a SDG 14, 15. So thank you very much. I thank you very much for, for, for sharing for this one and look forward to any question uh, and query. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hendra for highlighting the importance of nature-based solutions, in particular in this instance, the, the need to conserve uh, mangroves, not only in, in order to address the impacts of climate change and to help uh, with that carbon storage, but also um, you've highlighted the economic and social benefits that can also be gained. Thank you. Now I will turn to our third speaker, Ms. Tamar Jasiliani from Georgia. Thank you very much and good morning everyone. Um, this is really an honor and privilege to be the part of UN Nippon uh, family. Um, besides that, I'm the director of Maritime Transport Administration of Georgia. Today I will speak about the importance of uh, climate change elements in the national transport policy agenda from Georgian perspective. Um, everyone in this room is more or less aware that world commodity, 80% um, of world commodity is carried by the sea. Um, it is crucial to understand that uh, conservation and sustainable use of ocean seas and marine resources um, for sustainable development is the cornerstone of SDG 14. SDG 14 is a historic uh, achievement as it acknowledges the importance of uh, ecosystems to the livelihoods of millions of people around the world. Um, the goal itself commits governments uh, to conserve uh, um, and sustainably use oceans, seas and marine resources uh, for sustainable development, giving this important source of food and biodiversity uh, the recognition it deserves. Uh, advancement of technology and um, more sophisticated um, solutions are flooding the world scene uh, in every aspect of our um, lives. Um, our daily livelihood is uh, extremely dependent on the use of technology and where I think the shipping is no exception. More advanced ships are coming and um, but we rarely see the uh, technologies that use either uh, alternative means to fuel their main engines. Uh, maritime transport actually was not considered under the Paris Agreement uh, and as a result was never included in the uh, National Climate Action Plan. It is noteworthy to uh, mention that unlike Paris Agreement, IMO does not recognize differences between uh, developed or and, and developing economies, nor does it distinguish their intake in climate change issues. So International Maritime Organization is uh, the global scene which can be taken up as an example where differences do not matter and where uh, no more favorable treatment is available for the countries which are trying to avoid implementation of the global agenda. Uh, in April 2008, IMO adopted um, 
an initial strategy um, on this matter, which aims at the reduction of two total annual greenhouse gas emissions from sheep by at least uh, 50% by 2050, uh, comparing it with 2008, and includes quantitative reduction targets uh, through mid-term, short-term, and long-term uh, uh, policy uh, measures to help achieve the targets. Um, so the, this is why it is very important to include the climate um, issues in the national uh, maritime transport policy agenda. And what Georgia is doing for that, um, Georgia is one of the pilot countries of uh, under a global maritime energy efficiency project, which is administered by IMO, UNDP, and GEF, volunteered to develop three guides um, with the Institute of Marine Engineering Science and Technology. Namely, the first is rapid assessment for determining the country maritime energy efficiency and emission status, developing um, maritime energy efficiency strategy, and the third one is implementation of Marple Annex uh, 6 into national uh, legislation. So founding fathers of uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea uh, foresaw the future of oceans um, would be dependent on information sharing and technology transfer. Uh, so is the shipping worldwide, and uh, Georgia is one of the pilot countries, uh, certainly is looked at how uh, th those three documents are implemented and carried out um, in order to enable other countries to follow the same carbon emission-free shipping uh, with low sulfur futures. So we commit ourselves to reach those goals and we commit ourselves to implement those tasks in coming months. So I think I can stop here because of the time limits and then we can discuss it in Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Tamar, for highlighting uh, the action that has been taken in the International Maritime Organization with respect to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from shipping. And also, of course, the actions that are being taken in your country, which is very exciting uh, because that um, also there's a glimmer of hope that perhaps in the future we will be moving with the right technology to emission-free shipping. So, um, well, now I'm pleased to give um, the floor to our fourth speaker, Mr. Anas Saleh Mohammed Alamush from Jordan. Thank you, Gabby. Good morning uh, to everyone. My name is Anas and I come from Jordan. Uh, last year, I finished my, thanks to Dualos, I finished my uh, research about port sustainability. And I argued that port sustainability contribute to all the goals of the, the sustainable development goals. Currently, I am doing my research and PhD at the World Maritime University. And my friend here talked about the shipping uh, and climate change, I will be talking about the port role uh, uh, mitigation in climate change. Once we look at the port, the port are intensive energy consumption. And it's uh, tricky here because we have the port and we have the ship port interface. Uh, looking at the forecast, uh, the, 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 the shipping emission business as usual will increase up to 250 percent by 2050 from 2008 level that means also too much port handling too much uh, emission in the port side and here comes uh, my role to look at how can the port mitigate that the port side has cargo equipment cargo haggling equipment which is totally dependent on fossil fuels uh, they have indus other industries inside the port, and they have the ships. B the port recently came up with many uh, measures, such as technology measures, pre and after treatment, energy measures, such as alternative fuels, hybridization, uh, electrification, and also the, uh, uh, the, the operation measures, increase the port uh, energy efficiency, doing the, 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 the work in less time. Those are really promising measures, Shockingly, not many ports are taking that, and the, the, the level of, ta of take up is very low. I wanted to look at the level in my country, Jordan, but I, 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 I found out that ports all around the world are really reluctant and uh, not taking actions 
and not adopting the measures. And I would ask, my, uh, ask myself, like, what's, what are the reasons? The reasons, there are barriers and there are challenges. The barriers, such as uncertainty in regulation, port, if they impose actions against shipping or their tenants, they would lose competitiveness to other ports that would not do that. And as well, uh, they, they, they reach for, uh, for capital. Here, I want to say that, that uh, ports uh, decisions are, will be 400 of years ahead. And the measures that we are taking are not silver bullet. We need to think wide and think in a bigger, wider perspective because for each measure that I already mentioned, there are consequences, there are by bad sides, and there are also costs. So here comes my contribution in research. I don't look only at the bright side of the measures, how they contribute to the carbon mitigation, but also I look at the negative side, how th they will impact in other ways the climate change, and how do we model the right combination because different from shipping, port uh, uh, follow national jurisdiction, and each port is different in geography, in amount of handling, and other, other things. Just to, uh, to, to, uh, to link the port uh, actions with the sustainable development goals, uh, port mitigation uh, and climate change not only contribute to the goal uh, 13, but it contributes to goal number one in poverty, contributes to goal number two, uh, hunger, contributes to the social well-being, goal number three, contribute to goal number seven, access to renewable energy, contribute to goal number eight, uh, economic growth, contribute to goal number nine, uh, building resilient uh, uh, infrastructure through mitigation, contribute to goal number 11, uh, 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 economic uh, sustainable cities and communities, communities and contribute to, co uh, to goal number 12, uh, responsible consumption and production. The, the, the issue uh, is very wide. And I am looking at a lot of papers. Uh, throughout my first paper, I looked around 650 articles. There are a lot of measures, but it's uh, tricky. We need to, to think uh, positive. We need to stay focused and find the right com co combination. And I will be doing that and offer it to, to, to the policymakers, uh, the maritime industry, and academia, hopefully in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anas, and I hope you'll do it fast because <laughs> time is of the essence. But certainly you've highlighted the challenges, but also the potential of, poor, uh, of uh, the role of ports in facilitating the reduction of emissions. So um, let's hope that you'll be able to find all the research, and I think you're on the right road. So let's turn to speaker number five, Mr. Everett Sioa from Samoa. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, as, uh, as, as of that, I would like to kick off the discussion on the implementation of, sorry, on the role of capacity building in allowing states to implement their international legal obligations. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Everett Sio. Um, I am a young solicitor from the Office of the Attorney General in Samoa. I have noticed um, the importance of building up our capacity to meet all our legal obligations created under international law. As an alumni of the UN Nippon Foundation, the outcome of this um, fellowship has proven very beneficial in equipping us with the right tools, the skill set, and the network to meet our commitments for ocean governance, and in particular, the SDGs. Um, as, a, um, as a solicitor of the AG's office, our role is to advise government on whether or not our national legislations and regulations sufficiently cover all legal obligations created under international law before we proceed to ratify or exceed it. More importantly, our office um, assists the government with the procurement of resources and drafting of contracts for those procurements. As a small island developing state, the government needs to procure the technical assistance. It needs to meet certain legal obligations under international law. Therefore, the need to procure and contract the relevant parties to provide the technical assistance we need must be done. 
Um, so as small island developing states, we can agree that the successful implementation of national legis legislations and policies is very much dependent on the capacity of institutions to fulfill their roles. Resource mobilization to augment capacity development is fundamental and the call for continuous support from development partners and the donor community are urgently needed. During, a, during an analysis that was conducted by one of the ministries back home, the Ministry of Natural Resource and Environment, the ministry highlighted increased awareness on environment and climate change as one of the strength attributes to their sector plan. However, the institutional capacity was also highlighted by the, by the ministry, but it was one of the weakness at attributes for their plan. Therefore, increasing awareness of the impacts of climate change on our oceans is just the first action towards combating climate change. Applying and enforcing our laws and regulations is the next action. Therefore, in order to continue meeting our legal obligations created under international law, our governments and communities will need adequate staff and financial resources to carry out their works. The reality for small island developing states is that it is often difficult to meet our international legal obligations and commitments given the capacity constraints that we face. Capacity of national government to participate in development and implementation of international law has been limited by a range of factors, including the availability of financial, technical, and human resource. Resource limitations have resulted in significant difficulty in relation to implementing and enforcing these laws. So you can have the perfect legislation, but if you do not have the institutions to um, fulfill those or carry out those roles, those legislations are pointless. So if you're probably wondering, does international law and SDGs have a role in addressing capacity building needs? The short answer to that is yes. The need for capacity building to assist national authorities in SIDS to respond to climate change has long been recognized under international law on ocean governance and climate change. Uh, I'd just like to pull out an article. Um, article 11, paragraph three of the Paris Agreement notes that all parties do cooperate to enhance the capacity of developing countries, or developing country parties to implement this agreement. Developed country parties should enhance support for building actions in developing, in developing country parties. So SDGs and its 169 targets also address the capacity building needs such as SDG 13, target 13.3, SDG 14, target 14.3, and SDG 17, target 17.9. With the adoption of the 2030 agenda, UN member states pledged to ensure no one will be left behind and to endeavor to reach the further behind first. To conclude, addressing capacity development needs is an essential building block of successful sustainable development to ensure that the states are able to meet their international legal obligations. Thank you. Thank you, Everett, for highlighting the critical importance of capacity building for SIDS in particular, but I would say also probably other developing countries, but your perspective is a SIDS perspective in order to enable states to implement their international uh, legal obligations, but also for reminding us there are already many provisions actually in many treaties uh, and also in other um, policy outcomes that uh, provide for such. And of course, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea is no exception also on that. Um, so now turning to our last uh, speaker, Ms. Yvonne Edwin from St. Lucia, please. Good morning. I am Yvonne Edwin from St. Lucia. I work with the Department of Fisheries through the Ministry of Agriculture. I'm an information and communication officer. And my role here is to speak of climate action and the important role that education plays in changing behavior or causing actions to happen. I think we can all agree, based on the speakers and what we've heard for this week, that the impact of climate change is inescapable. The call for immediate global action, it comes at a time when both science and recent experiences that we have seen and heard tells the same story, that the time for action is now. 
the reality of climate change for people coming from a small island developing state like mine or from the Caribbean, and I'm sure a lot of us can relate, that the frequent occurrences of extreme weather and obvious changes along the coast, it's evident. Our fishers see it, our farmers see it. They're aware of the problems because it's evident in their catch and the changes as it affects their livelihood. My question is, if this is so obvious, why are we not taking the necessary action? Why is it business as usual? And that is why the importance of public awareness, education, information sharing cannot be overemphasized. Education and capacity building plays a pivotal role in changing behavior and it is most influential in impacting knowledge and understanding. What I do know is convincing anyone to change is a challenging task. They need to understand the issue before they can change that behavior. And going into schools and the work that I do in my country, it is very clear that this is the way to go. It is to build capacity and to build capacity through the opportunity that all of us alumni have through the Napon Foundation, getting to forums such as this one, the Climate Week, building our capacity, our skill set and tools, and going back into our country and dissecting the information that we have learned or the skills and tools that we have gained. This Napon Foundation opportunity takes us all over the world, rightfully so, because we have a network of persons who share best practices in their country, and that nexus of information gives us the opportunity to understand it and to go back and impact that knowledge and understanding. There are many reports. We just received one this week on climate change from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and there are many other reports. The blue this, the blue that, strategies, plans, actions, but how can the average person understand this? We are the ones who could go back and break it down for them, get them to understand the real action, the actions that they need to take. No one has the time maybe to read those lengthy documents and that is where the important role of education can change that behavior. I have seen this firsthand, and like I said, I do a lot of work in schools and throughout communities, and that is the way you cause people to change their behavior. It's through understanding and through knowledge. Another key aspect is how you communicate that information. It has to be clear. Environmental messages are not always something that people will pick up on, so it has to be enticing, it has to be t detailed enough, and it has to be clear with an action-oriented focus. We cannot do this alone, and so partnerships are important, collaboration. There are several ministries doing the same things. There are several departments, NGOs, agencies doing the same thing, and so collaboration is key in getting persons to change their behavior and to take the relevant actions. And so the multiple players across the various sectors have to work together, hand in hand, and that is one approach that could help reap the benefits and results that we are looking for. Reaching the public through a multiple combination of mediums is also important. Technologies at our hands, social media, and all of the things that we used in the past, flyers, brochures, all of those are important and not just focusing on only one will not drive the message home. We need to use multiple mediums to get that message across. Again, it has to be clear. And at the end of the day, the direct benefits of this and going into schools and educating the youth is extremely important. Educating everyone or every resource user, every person, this can affect. And, and we do know climate change will affect all of us. And so we need to create those movers of change, and we can do this through the youth. Ultimately, it will change behavior. They will bring those messages home, and that is important. We need to take action now. The environment is in our hands. We need to act now for the people and for our planet. I thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne, for highlighting the need to 
basically have the importance of public awareness and education and information sharing for everybody to be able to understand what the problem is and to be able to act. And I take your point about breaking down all those complicated reports to something that will actually incite action. And of course, the importance of youth. And we already see youth so much engaged on the issue of climate change, and it's really very important. Well, um, I think um, there's some very common themes that are arising from many of the interventions that we have heard, and uh, certainly we've heard uh, that there's a clear nexus between the ocean and climate change, and we've also heard that there is a relationship between the climate and the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development as they relate to the ocean. Uh, before turning uh, the microphones over to you, the audience, I would like to just ask uh, one question, and that's uh, basically following up on the last two interventions that were made. And uh, so and I'd like to hear from the entire panel, if I can, briefly. Uh, in your experience, what are the key areas in which education and capacity building would assist in meeting climate change and other SDG goals and targets? Are there barriers to introducing or obtaining these? And among these, what would be the single most important educational or capacity building initiative to assist in addressing climate change? So it's quite a loaded question. I don't hope you got it, and I'm happy to repeat it. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll start the other way, uh, because we're ready for to just to uh, change the order a little bit. So thank you. I believe the single most important thing is incorporating all of this into our education system. That is one sure way. Again, the youth can play such an important role because they do take those messages home. So the very thing that we want persons to hear, we want persons to take action on, is to incorporate it into the education system. A lot of the material that are in schools speaks to what the sustainable goals develop, the sustainable development goals wants us to do. So I think incorporating it into the system and getting teachers and students to take the necessary action is one sure way. Yeah, uh, just to build up on that, um, I think uh, international cooperation um, amongst developed and developing countries are is very key. Um, I think, I, as I mentioned during my um, presentation, is that um, we. We cannot do this alone. Um, we, we, we need um, cooperation amongst all member states to help us achieve all our obligations. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the, I'm taking this opportunity to, to, to wish uh, all the seafarers all around the world, 90% of them are men and 1% are women. I would like to everybody, and including the audience, to wish them a happy seafaring day. Uh, the capacity building in education, <laughs> throughout my research, I, I found out that uh, w w see, uh, uh, women seafarers are facing a lot of challenges. And this needs to be addressed uh, not only at the national level, but all in the international level. I already said that there is one person. And what are the barriers? The barriers that those, those females, they need uh, certification and this certification is not going to happen in their country. This will ha this has to open the door from all the international shipping lines to let them uh, train, to let them get certification. And this will not contribute to only goal uh, four education or five gender, but also to the climate change. Because those women in coastal community uh, during the, the climate uh, actions will lose their jobs, and we will find them another job through seafaring. Thank you. Thank you. And just before we go on, uh, um, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, or the yeah. we had the International Maritime Day, and uh, the theme of this year's International Maritime Day was empowering women yeah, in the maritime. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that was a good, a good start to focus on that issue. So, um, from my point of view, I will follow my friend from Jordan, and um, I will uh, emphasize two aspects. One is the soft power and seafarers are considered as uh, maritime soft power. Therefore, it is very important to raise the awareness amongst them about the climate change issues. 
And uh, as I remember, IMO has developed um, the courses to train the CIFARs in this regard. And um, it's, I think it's about energy efficient operations of ships. And this model course lays out um, methods of optimized ship handling, fuel management, ship board systems, and etc. So I think the first thing is uh, the maritime soft power, and uh, the second thing is empowering women in maritime. And um, uh, I women empowerment in shipping uh, as the driving force uh, behind the major change, I think it's vital. And um, as the director of National Maritime Administration, I'm, um, um, for me, it's the top priority to educate the women in maritime. That's why we founded the Women's International Maritime and Shipping Association, Wista Georgia, which is the branch of international one. And we serve as a watchdog to empower women in maritime. And in this year, we uh, sent out four women uh, to get the education all over the world. So I think that's the main thing what we can do for it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Madam Director. So I think is I want to raise two points. Um, um, since we like, maybe we can say there's a lack of uh, awareness regarding for how important of the uh, coastal and ocean ecosystem. So I think is uh, the area that we need to improve this is can be what say the uh, ocean and climate literacy. So we have uh, next year we have the ocean science ticket, but the way we uh, perceive the way, the way to see that how the importance of coastal ecosystem should be more in, in terms of the climate, so it should be more uh, than before. And then <coughs> the other thing is like we need to, you know, to develop and, and to encourage what we call the citizen, citizen science. This is we need, to, we need to allow them, especially like uh, for the area that I concern, especially blue carbon, allow like uh, uh, students or the farmers or fishers talk by them their own language and then share the own language and then can be raising awareness and how the important of the uh, coastal ecosystem. And then the second thing is, um, I would like to echoing what the Anas mentioned, this is the role of the women is really important because this can be, um, you know, to guide and the lead of the next generation to conserve the uh, coastal ecosystem. And to finalize the round of answers, uh, no, for me, I think that uh, capacity building on mitigation and adaptation uh, strategies and action plans are key for coastal communities and also for countries. From the findings of the IPCC report, we see that some of these scenarios are happening anyways. So uh, having feasible actions and, and a clear way forward for, for communities and countries uh, should be highlighted and also the importance of nature-based solutions that I think it's like the most uh, tangible uh, solutions that we already have in our countries and then more about like a barrier the thing that I do think it's important is for countries to identify their own capacity building needs because the same recipe would not work for everyone the same so yeah like doing that internal evaluation of which capacity building needs each of these countries have will uh, serve to uh, uplift the, the improvement on capacity building initiatives. Thank you very much for giving your views. Um, I'm conscious of time. We only have nine minutes left, so I, don't, I would like the audience to also have an opportunity to ask any questions that they may wish. So um, the floor is now open for questions. Great, thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Famara. Uh, thank you all the presenters for sharing your experience with us with the different areas of your expertise. Um, this is, might be a general question to all of you, but specifically on the, um, the shipping um, uh, guys over there. So um, we know basically um, usually shipping, uh, fisheries, and environment are usually in a different ministries. And then uh, for us to work together, uh, to meet the SDG targets like the 11, um, the 14, and the 13, we need to have a national um, collaborating effort. I don't know at your level of your countries, how do your ministries work together to ensure that 
um, the interest of one ministry does not inflict on the other one so that we can all work together and ensure that our coastal environment is protected but also um, coordinate our efforts in reducing um, climate um, impact on the ozone or on the coastal area or on the environment. Thank you. It's a very good question, so I now pass over to the panelists who would like yeah. to answer. Okay, nice. Uh, you talked about the uh, climate impact in the coastal area. And I will answer you from uh, my area of expertise, which is the port. Uh, and this will take me not only to the cl uh, port climate uh, mitigation, but also to adaptation. And the issue is, it's only sink or swim. So either port take action to adapt or they will lose a lot and they will uh, 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 sink. And uh, the, if ports will not adapt uh, to climate change, what will happen? The, 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 the impact will be drastic because ports are uh, drivers of economy and they are also uh, uh, fa facilitator for countries' interconnectivity and socioeconomic uh, actions. So ports, will, if they, they don't adapt, they lose jobs, they lose uh, economy, and they lose uh, as well interconnectivity. And this will lead also the, the port to uh, the country to increase emission because they will depend on land transportation and aviation. And this will also, uh, a lot of consequences, one of them, the, the disruption of supply chain and the, 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 the lead time, too much inventory, too much storage, too much consumption. So. I think all countries, including us, needs to adopt and need, we need to connect with the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development uh, initiatives to, to, for uh, ports adaptation all over the world. So uh, about the coordination uh, between the ministries and um, what we're doing together, um, that's a very good question and uh, I can say that uh, my agency is under the Ministry of Economy, so we have very tight coordination with Ministry of Environment, with Ministry of Education, and, and in general with the government to implement those things. And what we have done together, I, I can highlight during past year, is uh, we've done two things. Uh, one was the effective regulation of harbor rules. Uh, we have decreased the time um, uh, time uh, wasting, w waiting in of ships in our port. So as a port state, we decreased that, that at by 80%. And this means that ships are not delayed and, any, and therefore uh, they are not uh, emitting um, fuel burns. And the second thing, what we have done together with the Ministry of Environment is we are encouraging the ports and as a flag state, we are encouraging ship owners to have the uh, green incentives uh, in the operations. So for example, the um, cold ironing, maybe my friend knows it better, the cold ironing thing, and in terms of flag, uh, low streaming weather routing in, in order to decrease the, um, the, to save the fuel, yeah, that's, that's what we have done, yeah, thank you. Thank you, would anybody else like to address this issue? Yeah, I, mean, I think we'd like to add that this is one of the, maybe the tools that can be used for harmonize or coordinate for the, among the ministries, especially for the coastal is the marine special planning is, is one of the tools that how we can harmonize that one of the sectors cannot be, you know, cannot be determined or cannot be make it that the uh, sectors to become uh, worse. So that's why we have to harmonize it through the marine special planning. That's a very good point and integrated coastal zone management and uh, marine protected areas and <laughs> other. So there are lots of possibilities. Any, uh, I think we have time for one more question. Yes, please. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Marvin. I'm Taiwanese and Amer American. And thank you for coming coming in today addressing a crucial issue, a social issue that will affect the youth in many ge generations to come. Now, my main question is more or less the idea of global cooperation, as this is not a national issue or an issue just by state, but an, an issue that, every, that we have to face globally as countries work together. But as we've seen, many countries and companies start dumping waste and start destroying coral reefs by building on top of them. And the main question is more or less of how do we work together if other countries still do not abide by international law and will still continue to destroy 
the oceans and not fulfill the SDG goal of 14. So, who would like to take that question? Maria? The Sustainable Development Goal sets a roadmap with clear targets and actions, and I think that in itself is enough for all countries to read from that roadmap as to where we go as it relates to all these environmental issues. So that is one way. Of course, collaboration is always important, and we cannot do this alone. And, and the very saying that we are in this together and we have to do this together globally, it's, the, it's what we need to continue pushing and individual countries as to what they do and how they move forward, the roadmap and what we need to stay focused on is the sustainable development goals and ensure that we achieve those because it's clearly spelled out, the targets and the actions are in there and that is what should bind us together, but we should move together. And maybe just to, to add on what Yvonne was saying, I wanted to highlight the importance of partnerships because we usually, well, usually know because in international law, the member states are the, like the formal players. But I think that uh, multiple stakeholders like uh, NGOs or the private sector, now I think that it's very visible during this week that these partnerships and um, uh, they have been working together. It's not the usual only member states, but you can also get a lot of these other synergies that can be built between private sector, civil society, and governments. Yeah, um, so actually there was a similar question that was asked like this in the beginning of the year. Um, sorry, beginning of the year, beginning of the week. <laughs> Still early in the morning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, um, so usually when, how, how parties go about in um, meeting their um, cooperating or fulfilling their obligations is that it's usually embedded in their legislations that they need to meet this. Uh, um, the, the, the fact that we have to enforce this is entirely up to the institutions that, um, that administers that, um, that act. So the initiative needs to come from the government and the government and the people will need to also push for the government to fulfill those roles, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think now we've come to the, yes, I think we're out of time, but uh, I want to thank, first of all, all the panelists for their informative insights and, of course, for the great work that they're doing. Uh, you are our future. <laughs> but not only this panelists, so is the audience. So uh, I want to thank everybody and thank you also for the questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you again to our panel, and I love the call to action because it's not just them fixing the future, it's you here in the, where are we? We're in the SDG Action Zone. <laughs> I expect audience interaction, folks, um, and the live stream audience expects it too. We are so excited again. This is the last day of our super week for SDGs, and if you haven't posted yet today, please do it now. There were so many tweetable moments from our um, awesome opening panel. The hashtags are Act for SDGs, SDG Action Zone, and For People for Planet. We have had hundreds of millions of uh, impressions and interactions over the last few weeks with those hashtags, so we can't wait to see what comes out of this incredible week.